Good morning. Good morning. Today we are going to celebrate All Saints Sunday. It's one of the important uh, Sundays in the Lutheran Church. We're going to remember all those who were baptized into Christ uh, since the last All Saints Sunday. And we are also going to remember the people who went before us. Um, I'm not so sure if you are aware of that, but it's really important. Um, it makes, at least it changed my life and I realized what it means for us. In accordance to Luther, we are all sinners. Even after we are baptized, we will remain sinners. We will um, have that element of brokenness in our life. But also at the same time, we are saints, each one of us. Not because of what we do, but because of what Christ did for us. And so um, it really changes everything when you think about, you know, sometimes people think that the church is perfect, the people in the church are perfect. No, we are not. We are sinners, but we are also saints. Please rise for the confession and forgiveness, which is found in your bulletin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, clothed in majesty ever since the world began, who loves us and frees us from our sins, who leads us with all the saints to everlasting life. Let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God. God, our Maker and Redeemer, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have come to refuge in your infinite mercy. You have given your only Son to die for us. Have mercy on us, and for his sake forgive us all our sin. By your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and your will, and true obedience to your word that by your grace we may come to everlasting life, to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God has, has, <clears throat> Almighty God has had mercy on us, and God's only Son has been given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. Believing in Jesus' name, you have received power to become the children of God. And you have re received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Togethering him today is for all the saints. We will sing verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, number 422.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. with you all. And also with you. We turn to your celebrate in search for the prayer of the day. Almighty God, you have knit your people together in one communion with the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant us grace to follow your blessed saints and lives of faith and commitment and to know the impressible choice you have prepared for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 11th chapter. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away that stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you? that if you believe, you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked up and said, Father, thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, and bind him, and let him go. The Gospel of the Lord. I invite you to be seated at this point, and please join me.
in singing Jesus Loves Me as the children are invited to come forward. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Good morning, boys and girls. It's good to see you all. I hope you had a happy Halloween. Did you all get candy? Well, very good. So it was a happy Halloween. I'm so glad to see you here. You did get an orange pumpkin to collect your Halloween candy in? Yeah, very good. I'm glad. <clears throat> Today is a day that we call All Saints Day. Now, if you had to tell someone what is a saint, would you be able to do that? No, it's kind of a difficult, it's kind of a difficult word. We don't really use it a lot, do we? We probably, the only time we use it is probably here. And I would think that if I would asked the adults, they would also have to think about what is a saint. Let's talk a little bit about what makes a saint as we understand here at the Lutheran Church to be a saint. Would you be surprised if I would all call you saints? Because it doesn't mean anything to you, you wouldn't be any bit surprised. Let me, let me define what a saint is. Let me give you the, the easiest version of what I think a saint is. A saint, here's what a saint is not. It doesn't have anything to do with what you do or how you behave. What makes you a saint does not depend on your behavior. So if somebody says, oh, you're such a saint because you delivered cookies, that's something that we do say, but in our understanding, here at, at the Lutheran Church, what makes a saint has nothing to do of how we behave. Well, what does make a saint is how we see ourselves how we understand ourselves when we think of Jesus. What makes a saint in our understanding is how we see ourselves in our relationship with Jesus. So let me ask you, do you love Jesus? Do you think Jesus loves you? That makes you a saint. Do you think Jesus even loves you when you have a bad day? Do you think Jesus loves you when you have a really bad day? Do you think Jesus loves you when you have made really not so good choices? That makes you That was kind of scary for me now. Yeah, that was, wasn't it? It's the Holy Spirit, Pastor Dirk says. That makes you a saint to trust that even though sometimes we do make choices that are questionable, choices that might hurt others, or we are hurt by other people's choices, Jesus never stops to love us. Now, that has also the consequence that we see that sometimes we make choices that are wrong, right? We talked about that before. And what is our part in that relationship? When we see that we make wrong choices, what's our part? God still loves us, but what, what are we invited to do when we make wrong choices and we recognize them? We ask for forgiveness. 
Will God grant us forgiveness if we ask, seriously ask, from the bottom of our heart? Will he forgive us? Yes. Now here's the thing. If we trust that if we for, if once we, we confess that we had a wrong choice, and we truly are sorry for it, and God truly forgives us, if we trust exactly that promise, we are saints not because of what we did, but because of what God did for us. That makes us, it's all about how we see ourselves in relationship with our God. That what makes a saint. We have a little bit of a part. We need to understand that we need to be sorry. But it's all about God. Remember my little book I always bring? Can you all see that kind of? Here. I'll read the story to you for All Saints Day. Do you know any saints? Do you know any saints now? Who are the saints? Us. Are those people saints out there? Okay, we'll let them in, huh? Because God let them in a long time ago. My grandmother and granddad used to read me stories from my children's Bible and teach me prayers. They were saints because they were the voice of God. Our neighbor goes to the soup kitchen and serves meals to people who don't have food. She is a saint. See, there it is about what she does, but it, that you need to listen to the full story. My best friend is a saint too because he plays with a boy during recess that all the other kids pick on. Saints are people who help others to know God. That's another. If, you, if God shines through you, that makes you be a saint. We are all saints. Today we celebrate all the saints we have ever known and especially the ones who have died. I celebrate my grandmother and my granddad. They are with God now. My dad says they are with us too, but we just can't see them. I wish we could. My dad says they worship God with us. He says they pray with us and sing with us, and they are always here with us during the Lord's Supper. Today, when our pastors serve the bread and the grape juice, which we don't do today, I think about grandmother and granddad. I wonder where they are sitting. I wonder if they <clears throat> notice how tall I have grown. We sing for all the saints. We already did that, and we'll do it again later. And I cry just a little bit. Do you know any saints? You can celebrate them on All Saints Day. There is a little bit of God in every one of us. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you make us saints, that you make us holy because of what Jesus did for us. And so it is that because we are yours and you make us holy, we share your love with others so that they see your light shine through us. In Christ's name, amen. Now, as you get up, I'd like you to take a good look at this because we'll be talking about this in a little bit. So you, I just want you to, and you can actually touch it if you like to, once you go back to your places. We'll talk about it once you get back to your places. That's the adult sermon for day. day. It has an object lesson. It's my show and tell. But if you need to touch it, you sure can as you go back to your seats. It's okay to touch. Doesn't that feel nice? Especially the... Yeah. You can trace it with your hands. It's okay. God does not mind. <clears throat> Friends in Christ, grace and peace to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Well... I didn't reveal what it is to the kids. I know some of them were a little curious about what it could be. But let me ask you, what do we have propped up here in the front? What do you call that? It's a Paul. Exactly. 
spelled P-A-L-L. That's where the pall bearers at a funeral get their name. It's a white piece of linen that has a beautifully embroidered golden red cross on the top. As you attend funerals here at Trinity, you have probably encountered the pall before. It might be that someone that you very dearly loved, that was very close to you, or only someone that you knew through our community of faith or through the community, has been covered in that pall. Someone that you dearly loved or someone that you knew during a funeral here at Trinity was covered with that pall. It is a visual reminder of who the church is and whose we are as the people of God. And I'd like to spend some time today on All Saints Day as we celebrate this special day in the church here to talk about the Paul and what it means in our life as we understand ourselves as the people of God. And to help us do exactly that, I would like to ask you to take your red hymnals and to go in that red hymnal to the front portion of the book on page number 280. We're not in the hymn portion. The page numbers are in the front part of the book on page number 280. And when you're on page 280, you will notice that we're actually at the funeral celebration of our hymn book and in our liturgy. And even though this is all a little theoretical, I hope you can still bear with me as we walk through this. There are red printed words, and those words we call a rubric. We will never say those words as part of the worship. They are instructions that are given to us as, as pastors um, as we lead the congregation of what we are about to do. And in that rubric on top of page 280, it reads, A thanksgiving for baptism may follow as a sign of being closed with Christ in baptism a pall may be placed on the coffin by family members, pallbearers, or other assisting ministers. The minister or a representative of the congregation may say, and then come words that we read, either or, either the left column or the right column, and I will read both as we ponder our All Saints Day <clears throat> meaning. When we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. That is one, or we can read, all who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In his or her baptism, and then we insert the name of the deceased, was closed with Christ. In the day of Christ's coming, he or she shall be closed with glory. I hope as you heard those words, you felt that there is a deep connection between who we are as the people of God and whose we are as the people of God, between baptism and death. Those two are inseparable. The waters of baptism are essential for our core being as the people of God. 
Because in the waters of baptism, God speaks over us that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, nor things here nor things there are able to separate us from the love of God. So let me ask you, like I asked the children, do you need to be dead to be a saint? No. You do not. The definition of a saint for us as adults is that saints are members of the church, which we call the church militant. It's, it sounds terrible, but it's the church that we are here on earth, and the church triumphant, which is the church that Christ has called in heaven. Saints are members of the church, militant or triumphant, washed clean by Christ's blood. Being a saint is not about what I do or don't do, but who I am, who you are in relationship with Christ. Being a saint is all about who we are in the relationship with Christ, and that relationship begins nowhere else but in the waters of baptism. And as we carry our infants or children that walk or even adults to that baptismal font, we actually say we drown in those waters with baptism to sin and we rise to newness of life. In those waters, we claim as people of God that death has no power over us anymore. And the same is true for us being sinners. We would define sin as a self-centered failure to trust God, as a self-centered failure to trust God. So, for example, when I look at myself in the mirror every morning, what I see, or any time I look in the mirror, I see a broken person. Now, if my three men in my household look at themselves in the mirror, they see something very different. They say Superman. It must be a, I don't know what it is. But God doesn't see me that way. God sees me as his child because I have gone through the waters of baptism and been raised through newness of life. While I see, and both are sins, seeing myself as not worthy of God's love is as much a sin as seeing myself as not needing God. Because in both cases, I do not trust that God is bigger than my pride and my unworthiness. Adam and Eve's sin that came into the world wasn't that they ate a fruit. Wasn't that they disobeyed God. It was that they wanted to be like God. They were relying on their selves rather than on God guidance and trusting that what he intends for them is just right. So with that in mind, the Paul is a visual reminder, and I love it when we as the church have something that we can actually lay our hands on, and that's why I was allowing the children to touch it, because it is a lot of times how we feel things when we get our hands on it. It's a visual reminder of two things. In that Paul, we are covered in Christ's righteousness. 
The beautiful thing about the pall is that it drapes entirely over the casket. It is completely covering the casket. Now, I don't like us to, especially when I talk to children about the pall, I always want to make sure that this is not a magic trick. When we take that pall off at the end of the worship service, our loved one is still dead. This is not like a circus trick or a magician. It is real. Death is a reality in our life. Not just at the end of our life, it is a reality of every day of our life. All those little deaths that we die and experience. But see, this is where the powerful thing is, and the symbolism of the Paul. Death has been swallowed up by God. In the waters of baptism, God has already won. One over all those little deaths in our daily life. One over what somebody says about the other person or what somebody thinks about the other person or what I think about a person or how I approach some things in my life and how somebody else approaches things in their life. We have the power to look at ourselves as a beloved child of God because not of what we did or didn't do, but because of what Christ already did for us. That's why there is an embroidered cross on top of that pall. See, death is underneath. Christ already won. And nothing will ever be able to separate us from that reality because it has been washed over us in the waters of baptism. But the Paul does something else. It's a great equalizer. This is the only Paul the church has. We're not going to buy another one. This is it. And it doesn't matter who you are in this life. It doesn't. Because it is the same Paul that is going to drape over you and me. It doesn't matter if the person under there has a state-financed casket or the most ornate casket in the world. I always say the, the, the ground beneath the cross is very level. There isn't anything that is higher or lower. There isn't anything we do or can do that will make us be more elevated at the feet of the cross. It is level, and the Paul does exactly that. It doesn't matter who you are. It's the same Paul that will cover your and my body, and that is the sad reality for all of us, isn't it? Because if Christ isn't going to show up anytime soon, most likely this is going to be what is draped over us at the end of our life. Because according to Luther, God looks at us as a saint and as a sinner at the same time. We're all called saints not because we change into something beautiful, that's again the reminder, but because of the relationship we hold with God and about what God did for us first. There's a beautiful saying, when you make a hard decision, right? We all have to make hard decisions in our life. Decisions where we don't know whether or not that's the right or the wrong decision. But just keep in mind, even if you make the right decision, you are still a sinner. You're still a broken person, even if you make the right decisions in your life. But here's the beauty, Luther says. The saints are sinners too, yes, but they are forgiven. That gives us power to live in freedom of all those little prisons we find ourselves in. So yes, this will be our future if Christ isn't going to be showing up anytime soon. And so becoming a child of God in the waters of baptism is actually a big deal because it defines who we are from our beginning. It is our core. When I had my very first call, I received a telephone call and somebody called me and said, Pastor, we need to get that baby done. 
And I thought to myself, well, Paul is only six months. I don't need another baby done. I don't know what they meant. Remember, English is my second language. So when they asked me to get that baby done, I tried to, to intelligently ask questions so that I would find out what they actually were trying to tell me. Well, what they were trying to tell me was that we need to get that baby baptized. Why? Just in case. Just in case what? Well, just in case something bad happens. Even if nothing bad ever happens, baptism is who we are. It's not an extended warranty, like you buy it for your car or your fridge. Baptism is who we are as the people of God. It frees us from everything that holds us down and burdens us. It's our core value of our relationship with God because in those waters we acknowledge that, yes, we are broken people. We don't have the power, even if we wanted to, to trust God 24-7 and allow him to be the ruler of our life. Yes, we're broken. Yes, we mess up. And yes, we're sinners. But in those waters, we become much more than sinners. We become forgiven so that we can go out and live our life without being bound in chains, but to have freedom from our chains. So we live in this tension of, yes, we mess up every single day of our life. But we also get a glimpse of what it means to be free. And I'm sure the Christmas commercials are starting to come on. And heed my words, there will be a commercial, I am absolutely sure, about a car company who is going to have a pickup wrapped in a red bull. Mind my words when you see it. That's a little bit of how we live in the right now, but not yet. When that person who looks at that red boat pickup looks at it, they look at it as, oh, it's already there. That's how we look at the glory that we will experience one day. We get a glimpse of what it means to be free, to not be bound by chains because we're people of God. But not yet. Because we're not yet there. We're not at that glorious table that our loved one is at that celebrates without any chains, physical or mental or any chains, because God has fulfilled their promise. In 1 Corinthians, we hear, we now see dimly, but then we see clearly. It's like the red boat pickup. We see something already that we want, and we long to be there with our loved ones. But we're not quite there yet, because God hasn't called us home yet. Remember the story from Lazarus? He got that foretaste, the foretaste we all get each and every day when we are reminded of the waters of baptism. Remember what Lazarus got? He got a foretaste of what it is to get a new lease on life. Because Jesus called him out of his chains. Jesus said, unbind him. But did you ever think about that Lazarus actually needs to die again? There was an actual funeral for Lazarus later on in his life. Because this lease on life that Jesus gave Lazarus at that particular moment was only a lease on life. A new chance. But then Lazarus still longed to see the full glory of God, like all of us, as we long to be reunited with our loved ones and as we faithfully keep carrying our children to the font because we know that there is something better to come. So may we wait in hope to get that glorious crown of righteousness not because of what we do or didn't do, but because of what Christ did for us. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please rise for the hymn of the day. We are going to sing 427.
427. <coughs> for, for all your sins, O oh Lord. At this time, I invite you to be seated as we come to our traditional All Saints um, memorial part. And I will ask the acolytes to light the blue candles in honor of all of the saints that are baptized into the name and family of God. And the first one in the alphabet is Hannah Marie Baumberger. Alaya Marie Christensen. Jackson James Antringer. Dalen Leroy Grayson. Layton Matthew Gust. Emma Grace Hagmeyer. Cash. Douglas Julian Hansen. Tyler Michael Jenks. Lennox May Jaratowski. Bodie Harper Moore. Drew Imani Moore. Greenlee Madeline Moore. Liam Marcus Murtha. Brinley Marie Olson. David James Swear. Macy Lynn Weidenbach. Evan Michael Williams, Adelaide Michaela Winters. The clear candles that we light are in memory of all those saints who have gone before us from one All Saints Sunday last year to this All Saints Sunday. William Billy Schnell, Dale Werheim. Laverne Bud Olson, Gerald Strube, then light the next one. And watch your rope. Peter Hoydal. Arthur Haig, 
Margie Randall, Paul Dawkin, Daniel Millard, Esther Hendry, Doris Kiner, Myrna Carlson, Riley Jensen, Lois Christensen, and Gary Seitz. No, we all, that's okay. You may extinguish that, and at this time we had invited you in memory and honor of your loved ones that have gone to purchase a carnation, if you so wish, and we will place them. I will read the first names, and you may follow along in the bulletin. Art. George. Helen. Dale, Bill, Della, Marie, Emma, John, Thomas, it's always good to hear the name twice. George, Viola, that keeps us all humble and reminds us of the life in our midst. Albert, Bertina, Don, Doris, Merlin, Olive, Bill, Bill, March, Sam, Cecil and Ella, George and Myrtle, Ashley Ann, Ashley Ann, Edgar, <clears throat> Pyros, Henry and Ada. Tony and Olive, Harlan, Marcella, John, Marjorie, Severin, Emma, Boyd, and Jack. While the acolytes are being seated, I invite us to take a moment of silence. united into one by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray with all God's saints for healing, wholeness, and peace in all the earth. God of glory, we ask your blessing for chaplains and all workers in the church. Grant them wisdom and compassion as they embody your grace in the forgotten places of this world. Lord, in your mercy. 
We seek your protection and healing for veterans, civil rights leaders, and military personnel. Where there is pain, bring comfort. Where there is anger, bring mercy. Where there is war, bring peace. Lord, in your mercy. We seek your healing for all who struggle with addiction, mental illness, physical ailment, or spiritual distress or grief. Refresh them with the water of life and fill them with your abundant love. Lord, in your mercy. We ask your blessing for nurses, doctors, social workers, and emergency responders. Sustain them to be vessels of your healing and comfort. Empower them to restore wholeness to the broken and hope to the despairing. Lord, in your mercy. We give you thanks for all the saints, especially all those who we named in our hearts today and the ones that were named out loud. Wipe away our tears of sorrow and mourning, and when we die, bring us to the church triumphant. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Into your care, Alpha and Omega, we entrust all for whom we pray. Be with us now and always, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. You may share God's peace and God's joy with one another. At that um, point, we are going to enjoy the adult choir, and we are going to have um, the offering.
was great. Please rise for the offertory. <laughs> Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth and in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord look up on you with favor and peace. Amen. You may, you may be, be seated. seated at this time for the announcements. There are um, Thanksgiving bags that we like you to pick up. That's part of our community Thanksgiving service preparations. The children decorated them in Sunday school, so feel free to pick up a bag. I can tell you that this is the first time the food pantry has had no corn on the shelves in, in its existence. So, now don't all bring corn, but um, just bring a good variety and even paper products are fine. Uh, Please return them here to the church, or if you would like to bring them directly to the community Thanksgiving service, you may do that also. Tonight you are all invited, if you are um, a couple, to join us for our couple uh, group at 6 o'clock, right? We have a potluck, yes. yep. and um, we are going to watch um, Raymond, I think. Raymond, Raymond yep, right? Raymond. Raymond, that's true. And um, at that point, um, I'd like to ask Emily to come forward and yep. maybe and her family. Beth, if you, do not, if you don't mind to come forward, we would like you to yes. come forward too. Emily, you, don't, you can take uh, your relatives with if you want to. She, here she comes. We have those two women come forward. When uh, Riley died exactly four weeks ago. Exactly four weeks ago. Today. About, um, well, at Close 8 o'clock, 8.05, eight oh um, right? We said it is a very overwhelming time in Emily's life and everyone's life. And so we asked that everybody who came to the service would, ask a, would sign on a quilt square. And then we asked our Sunday school students to do exactly the same. And then I had a spur of the moment idea and I called Bev. And I said, what do you think of putting a quilt together? And she went right with it, and I don't know, it took those four weeks to make it happen, but thanks for doing that miracle. And um, Riley did, can I give this to you before I forget? So that's, you know what that is. Um, Riley did like Mickey Mouse, and um, so it was, that's where I need your help, that we put this together, Emily, to have you remi be reminded that God's loving arms are always around you, that this is a very trying time. As the body of Christ, we all shared our love in this quilt with you. Um, Barb Alice was so kind to embroider um, all the data from, from Riley's life when he was born. And the time he was born, we pulled up the PowerPoint, the pictures that you had so lovingly put on there. Bev and Drew, some Mickey mice, on, mice, I guess, mouse on there. You find your poems and lots of words and messages of love. So, and of course, Mickey Mouse will be draping it around you in the hope that you will always find comfort 
that one day, now we see dimly, then you will see it clearly, and you'll have him back in your arms. All the saints, would you please rise?